G'day legends, I hope that you are having a fantastic Friday and a fantastic lead into your weekend. Now I did miss yesterday's update because I was out shooting for a video that's actually going to be relevant to this as well. That'll hopefully come I think tomorrow and I've also got a haircut and I think you might have f***ed it up a bit but we're going to roll with it. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to look at a horrible strike that has happened. We're going to talk about the Black Sea, we're going to talk about some nuclear testing, some information that's come out about Prigozhin as well of course then a look at the maps at the end and see what movements is there as we actually are seeing some movement after a couple of very slow weeks on the maps. Now we have to start with that there's just been a horrific strike that's killed over 50 people in Hroza in the Kharkiv region. Now, this was reportedly against a supermarket and a cafe. And the photos from this are just absolutely horrible and many dead civilians there as well. Of course, I won't share them on here. Now, it is worth noting as well that this town only has about 300 people. So about a fifth have actually been killed. Just the scale of how horrible this actually is. Now, Ukraine is saying that it was a Russian ice scanned a missile that hit the area, but as always, there's so much conflicting information about these strikes, and that will continue forward as well. As the informational sphere, it just gets blanketed in conspiracies, narratives, sensationalized, glorified. The, the information sphere around all of this is just such a mess to try and peer through what exactly is happening, what then happened. And of course, a lot of these narratives, conspiracies, things like this get amplified and gain traction by examples in recent events as well. But what I will say on this topic is that ultimately the aggressor country is responsible for these attacks. It, it, no matter what, it is just horrible. Russia is responsible for this. And that more than 50 people, including children, have lost their lives in a terrible attack. Now, I won't wade into the cesspit of ideas and conspiracies about this as well, I hope that the truth will unfold in time. And I hope that those are held to account that are responsible as well. Now, over the past, say, month, we've really seen an increase in successful Ukrainian attacks on Crimea. Now, primarily by missiles being your sort of storm shadow scalp ones supplied by the UK and France, but also as raids across by special forces troops as well. And we do have some more footage here of a raid that came out a while back, but with Ukrainian troops on jet skis going across, of course, the Black Sea to then go into Crimea. So we'll just watch this footage here. This will also be available on the Telegram if you'd like to watch it. You can see the 50 cal firing and the trace off. Now the reason this is relevant is news has come that Russia has relocated some ships of the Black Sea Fleet to more protected harbours. Although some ships and at least one submarine still remain in Sevastopol. And if Russia is unable to actually maintain this foothold in Sevastopol, it's led many to suggest that Russia then need to take Odessa to stop these assaults across and as well actually have power in the Black Sea for grain, things like this. So let's have a look at what has come out and look over these areas. So these are the satellite images that have come out from here. Now, this is in this Novorossiysk. I don't know how to pronounce it here, of these ships that were at one point in the Black Sea Fleet. And of course, this is from the 1st of October. And then we have another screenshot of the same uh, bloody naval base here as well in the area and these ships as well that were part of the Black Sea Fleet. And then we have this one as well, same area, but we do have one then of this base as well in Fio Diosia or whatever it is. But Whatever it is, what it's showing is that the ships have moved across from there. Now, we actually have these to have a look at of where exactly these are. So, if I sort my life out, so we'll see this is the first one where the three screen white shots were from. And, of course, we have Crimea here, Sevastopol, where the Black Sea fleet normally was, Kerch, and across the Black Sea over then to here. Now, what I was talking about was, of course, Russia maintained control down to here in the Kherson Oblast around to Crimea and in the south. What people are saying is 
well, if Russia want to maintain control in the Black Sea and stop these attacks, they really need to somehow push across through to Odessa here. But with Russia having very little offensive success, really, this last, let's say, 12 months, this is it seems very unlikely that that would happen. But yeah, theoretically, if you want to maintain control, that's what you need to get. Now, let's have a look where this other base is. Now, this is still on the Crimean Peninsula. Let's zoom out. So Sevastopol around to here. So those uh, ships have definitely been rotated and moved to there, although it is worth noting that these still can fire the cruise missiles from there and strike into Ukraine as well. But they are more protected from the drone boats and things like that, that we have seen. So, as well in this, Dmitryo uh, Pletinchuk, who's a spokesman for the Ukrainian Navy, said on Thursday that the Black Sea Fleet was constantly dispersing its ships. They realised that these are our targets and are constantly moving them between several ports. So, rotating them through to try and protect them. Now, he actually continues on in this as well. He also noted uh, Russian defence and security efforts around the so-called Crimean Bridge have been reinforced again. That's the bridge, the Kerch Strait Bridge we're talking about. That Ukraine at some point will have a real serious target. We have seen them hit it, and that was their attack that hit the car and took away the parents of a young girl. But it, it definitely isn't taken down. I think, well, I'm very surprised we didn't see it on the first days of the offensive and not more on it, but we have to see more strikes on this at some point. Uh, now we see nine units there, four ships, five boats, and the Border Guard Service, the FSB Maritime Guard. They are guarding this facility from the north and from the south. Even so, I would not write off the Black Sea Fleet. It is a rather serious grouping in which a lot of time and money has been invested. Now we see that the Russians have changed their tactics a little more and are dispersing their units as much as possible. Of course, they are afraid of being hit. Nevertheless, their aircraft continue to operate in our waters, which we have freed from the presence of warships. So, of course, they've moved the warships around to here, at least then the majority across to here and then to Fiadosa here as well. But, of course, the aircraft can still work around here as well as the cruise missiles. And this is what most people are saying. This is what the F-16s will most likely be used for is against those ships and the aircraft working in those areas too. But this just proves more or how Ukraine has been successful here and as well the use of these like UAV bloody drone boat things. Would it UAV? No, that's probably the wrong word. The US for the unmanned service vehicle and unmanned uh, submersible vehicle as well and the success and how they can be used in an area like this. Now, something else. Russia is claiming that they had a successful test of their experimental nuclear-powered cruise missile, the Burezvetsnik. Uh, probably pronounced wrong, but NATO designated the Skyfall missile. Now, something very interesting in this is that it is nuclear-powered as well as can carry a nuclear warhead. And we have seen with Russia's claimed a Poseidon um, unmanned bloody submersible drone torpedo we think that that is also nuclear-powered. The thing that nuclear power gives you in something like this is basically any range you'd want, that it is so efficient in that engine, it can take it far, far, far further. And they were saying with the Poseidon, it could go under the water for a number of months or years at a time, like a um, nuclear submarine can, that the only limit on a nuclear sub is the people on it, not the fuel. And that's what these gives. But we haven't got any like evidence this has actually happened yet. We have some evidence that they're building up to it, but no evidence that they had a successful test. We know there has been some failed tests of this before, but this is Russia's nuclear-powered cruise missile. Largely shrouded in secrecy, the diagram based on imagery released from the MOD represents a possible configuration. So, of course, we see these little wings of like a cruise missile here as well. Now, it uses a miniature nuclear reactor as its power source to provide unlimited range. This means that the missile could carry nuclear or conventional warheads to any target on the globe, manoeuvring to avoid missile defences along the way. Now, what we have been told about this is it was specifically made to get around missile defences. The nuclear reactor powers an electric motor that drives a turbine. This turbine draws in air, which is then compressed and pushed out of the missile for propulsion. Airflow over the reactor's elements prevents it from overheating. The nuclear-powered propulsion system is activated only after the missile achieves sufficient speed following a launch assisted by a liquid-fueled rocket boost. So rocket boost to get up, because of course the most amount of fuel is actually just used in getting up. Once a missile is cruising, very efficient. Same with a plane. You use so much more in takeoff than you do just cruising along. So boost it up, nuclear engine, 
go on for basically as long as you would want of your ultimate in loitering munitions. Putin has suggested that Russia could resume its nuclear testing for the first time in more than three decades. Putin has said that Moscow could theoretically revoke ratification of the International Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He noted that the US had signed the Comprehensive List Ban Treaty, but not ratified it, while Russia had signed and ratified the treaty. Putin said, I'm not ready to say whether we really need to conduct tests or not, but it is possible theoretically to behave in the same way as the US. Now, in February, Putin suspended Russia's participation in the New START treaty that limits the number of nuclear weapons each side can deploy. So let's have a look over some of this. Now, what people are really getting at is we have seen from satellite imagery here a buildup in this area up in Novaya Zemlya, whatever it is, up in the Arctic. This is an old Soviet test site where they used to do the nuclear tests as well and they've had seen new buildings and vehicles and stuff moving in and out of here as well this was from actually a new york times article that this is saying that this is then the missile launch area here and as well as data collection aircraft as we know if you've seen a nuclear bomb you see those like streak things go up as well they're basically like a bloody missile smoke thing but that also gives a lot of testing back too. So here's a photo of this said to be Skyfall with NATO designation of the Skyfall missile here. That's where they've got basically this from. We don't have much real confirmation about this. Putin has said also, in the event of an attack on Russia, no one has any chance of survival. I think no person of sound mind and clear memory would think of using nuclear weapons against Russia. This again gives weight to Putin's rhetoric and is an escalation, I guess, further on that as well. So let's see what TASS has quoted Putin as saying as well. Of course, TASS is Russian media. I want to assure everyone that as of today, the retaliation will be absolutely unacceptable for any potential aggressor, starting from the moment a missile launch has been detected, no matter where it comes from. Now, if you've seen around Chernobyl, there's big array thing. That actually was to pick up American missiles back in the Soviet days. Anyway, continuing at any point in the world's oceans or from any territory, there will follow a counterattack with so many missiles, so many hundreds of our missiles appearing in the air that no enemy will have a chance to survive. And we know this. This is part of the mutually assured destruction, the MAD treaty, that the world has that many nukes that no one's going to fire one because then we know it's all done and dust. Now, I don't believe that you know, Russia will actually use a nuclear weapon in this war. And I really hope that we don't for Ukraine's sake, for just humanity's sake in that I really hope that we don't see these. But I can see why, I think, if you look at it from a propaganda perspective, why more of this talk about nuclear weapons and potentially testing has come up. And if I was Putin, I think this would be the time to test these because people just sort of discredit any nuclear stuff like whatever. But for the first time in a very long time in this war, I'd say the, really the first time in this conflict, we have seen a growth in the pushback against further support to Ukraine. And I think strategically, a nuclear test would actually further influence people, that it would maybe give some credibility to what Putin... Because when Putin just says nuke, people are like, whatever, you say it so much, it's lost any sort of weight. Well, not any weight, but it's lost some weight. Where if they were to test one, I think that could push some more people. And what Russia really needs to do to win the war is if they can get that support to stop, that means then they will have success in the war, if that makes sense. But nuclear testing, whatever it's pulling out of these treaties, it does sail Russia further down a path of no return, and that off-ramp is really sort of leaving at that point. But I could see why testing could take place purely for, I guess, propaganda reasons if you get what I'm if you're picking up what I'm putting down in this as well. Now, let's have a look at what Putin has also said about the late Prigozhin. Now, Putin offered a bizarre explanation for Wagner Group financer Yevgeny Prigozhin's death during a press conference at the Valdia Discussion Club on October the 5th to deflect blame from the Kremlin. Putin stated that the Russian investigative committee head this bloke informed him that the investigation found grenade fragments in the bodies of victims on board Prigozhin's plane. Oh shit. Suggesting that grenades are detonated inside the aircraft. The investigative committee has reported publicly only that all 10 people aboard the plane died. Putin also emphasised that the investigation ruled out external factors that may have caused the plane crash and implied that the plane crash victims may have been using alcohol or drugs aboard that could have led to the negligent handling of grenades that were presumably on board for some unexplained reason. Putin claimed that while the investigation did not test the bodies for alcohol and narcotics, the Russian 
Federation Security Service, the FSB, uncovered five kilograms of cocaine during their investigation into Wagner, were likely referring to FSB's televised raids into Prigozhin's mansion in June and July 23, which is when we got the best photos ever of all of bloody Prigozhin's um, disguises. Bloody meme, fucking the memes that came out of that. It was fucking unbelievable. Anyway, Putin added that in his opinion, the investigation needs to test the body's four substances. Putin's bizarre explanation of the plane crash is likely an attempt to blame Prigozhin for his and his comrades' deaths and further disgrace him among his remaining supporters. So, of course, we believe that Putin was fearful of how popular Prigozhin was getting, that Prigozhin was on really an upwards trajectory of clarity in this that could actually threaten Putin's leadership and therefore was whacked. Now, I've actually been told as well that one of the main suspects in this was actually some French spies as well because of Wagner's influence in Africa and how France was losing power in places like Mali and whatever too, like Wagner Group, that people were pointing at the French there as well. Now, I've got nothing to back that up. It's just what I had been told. Well, now, let's look at what the British MOD has said. In recent days, Russia has been conducting civil defence exercises across much of the country based on a scenario of a large-scale international armed conflict. These exercises have taken place annually since 2012 and coincide with Russian Civil Defence Day on the 4th of October. This year's exercises are unlikely to have been dramatically changed or expanded. For generations, the USSR, the Soviet Union, and then Russia has paid attention to domestic preparations for a major conflict. However, even with the ongoing war in Ukraine, it is unlikely Russia has significantly changed its posture of national preparedness in recent months. So, of course, the USSR and Russia was really paranoid about the build-up of NATO and another war. And this is why Russia has so much stuff. This is why they've got, they're not going to run out of artillery and bullets. Mines. Just, they made so much of it for multiple world wars, basically. It's just paranoia. And this is why we see Russia with just so much equipment, and especially from that era as well. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look over the maps and have a look at some changes. So, of course, we have Ukraine, the centre, the capital of Kiev, the red areas, occupied since 22, and the purple since 14. Of course, the green and blue will be Ukraine, and the red will be Russia as we see the map move. Now, we are going to go over uh, Surak maps as well. There's nothing interesting on the ISW. War mapper says there's no differences, uh, but we will look at the daily Ukraine map up there and the deep state. So let's look over what Suriak has to say first. Now, as we enter October, the rainy season is upon us and with it the end of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in the south. During the last days, the Ukrainian attacks have considerably decreased and despite the fact that resources are still being allocated to these fronts, the Ukrainian military capabilities to achieve a considerable advance and reach no longer the sea of Azov, but the second main Russian line of defense are not enough. Gradually, the focus of attention will shift from the south to the east, where the Russian army, as it did last year, is expected to resume offensive operations along this entire front, with the aim of controlling the rest of the Donbass outside its control. One year after the annexation of these territories, the situation on the ground is still very different from the new maps. At present, the annexed oblasts are divided as follows. So, the Lugansk oblast that Ukraine hold 330 square kilometres at 1%, that Russia hold 98%, Donetsk at this amount, Zap at this amount, and Kherson at this amount. So Russia annexed areas that it doesn't actually hold the whole area of, if that makes sense there as well. But this is what the uh, amount in that is. Now, continuing on. With this situation, Russia has not been able to take territory it considers its own. Even to this day, the populations of the Donbass are still targeted by Ukrainian shelling. This has a negative impact on the image of Russia, which seems unable to achieve the objectives of the special military operation. For reasons such as these, the option of a major Russian offensive is more than necessary to turn the situation around and avoid a permanent freezing of the conflict. In fact, the coming months would present an opportunity for the Russian side to initiate this offensive, as the failure of the Ukrainian counteroffensive will negatively affect the defensive capabilities of the Ukrainian army, which, in addition to facing uh, quantitative losses during the Battle of Bakhmut and the Southern Fronts, will also have to face a reduction in US military aid. Every day it seemed clearer and clearer that Ukraine cannot win a long-term war. 
and even less so against so against a Russia that still retains large amounts of military resources, including those mobilized, a large part of which have not yet entered combat and are still being formed in the rear. In the coming months, we may witness important changes in the course of a war that is approaching its second year. So we're about to step into the second year. And we've spoken about before that when to sort of launch your offensive is on the back end of someone else's offensive. The best time for Ukraine to really push on Russia would have been when their offensives failed mid last year. But of course, the West didn't supply Ukraine with enough stuff to really take the opportunity of that at the time. Now, Syria continues here. During the last few months, a lot of data has appeared regarding the total number of casualties in the Ukrainian conflict on both sides. It is better to be cautious in believing these numbers. Some of them are quite overestimated and oscillating, as it will be very difficult to get a reliable number until the war is not over. It is also important to note some data includes both fatal and non-fatal casualties, making the numbers quite high. So it will say like total losses, but that will just include anyone who has been like severely injured, dead, whatever as well. One should even be reluctant to believe the numbers provided by the ministries of defense, as well as those alleged NATO documents that appeared several months ago. Like I say, I don't believe anything that comes out about casualty figures. Being conservative and cautious, what can be affirmed is that the conflict has already claimed more than 100,000 deaths, making it one of the deadliest conflicts in the world in the 21st century and the largest in Europe since the Yugoslav Wars. Moreover, it is interesting to see how this conflict is looking more and more like a war of attrition, similar to the Great War, in which a great amount of resources are consumed in an attempt to make small advances on a broad front of approximately 950 kilometres in length. But it is also interesting to note the balance of forces that is gradually being achieved between Ukrainian forces, losing more troops in proportion to their counterpart level of mobilized forces, mercenaries and recruits. If this trend continues, we may be approaching a turning point in the conflict that will be reflected in the events of the year 2024. So there's parts of that I agree, part, parts I disagree with, but it does look like we are stepping into a war of attrition and who can sort of hold out the longest on this as we have seen some wavering support really both ends and more people calling for peace there as well. Now, now we actually are going to step into the bloody maps. Now, on the deep state map, we see no change down here around Robertini, Novoprovka in here as well. But what we do have is a Surak map update of this area. Now, we don't see this area change on the day of the Ukraine map update either. Situation is up front. Russian army launched a counterattack and managed to recapture some positions west and southwest of Vibove following a Ukrainian army withdrawal. If we line up where these are, it's showing in this area, which is already shown, I guess, as Russian red on this and up in just this area here, which is still showing, I believe, red on the Russian map as well. Although it does show in this paddock that Russia has gained control because this paddock is, I believe, this one here on the map. And you can see where then the defensive works line up on this. Now, where we are going to step is we're going to head across west to this sort of Urizani front here that has been largely stalled. The only update we've seen over the past, say, week has actually been Russia making some ground near Purutini here. So let's have a step back, and then we see from the 3rd to the 5th that Russia made some ground in here. And we heard about this on Syriac, but then none of the maps reflected it. But now they are starting to reflect it. Daily Ukraine map update still doesn't reflect that. But let's look at what Syriac has said. Situation southwest of Donetsk. Russian army continue advancing north of Pututini and reached the uh, Grushevia Canyon for the first time since August. So they have pushed back to an area they have been and have not been, sorry, since August. So if we line up exactly where this is, these are these paddocks here. See this push out. Now what we can do is... We'll step back to there. So this is in the same area. We have seen that step up. And I like it when the maps show themselves to be the same. Now, we haven't seen any change through Vuladar, but then we come across to this sort of front near Medienka, and we do see a couple of interesting things that Suryak doesn't show, nor do the other maps. So we step back and then forwards, we do see the expansion of grey zone here that in my eyes would say that Russia actually exert more control if the grey zone has increased there, but maybe it's just a map correction also. But we come up into then Marienka and we see that Russia had an advancement on the northwest of Marienka there as well. That's not shown on the other maps. Now, no change as well around Avdivka or Pitney where we know Ukraine was pushing pretty hard and making some grounds in here. Then, 
what we'll do is pop up into Bakhmut and see what changes are being made in this area. This Andrivka, Klishkivka front, we do see that. Ukraine managed to hold more ground in here. They pushed that grey zone back as well as the Russians back in the south there. Now let's come up into the north and see what we see. We see it has changed, I guess, the shaping of the front line here. That Ukraine has exerted more control and this shaping here has changed that Russia has maybe gained a little bit and lost a little bit in there as well now where we are going to go is just north of Bakhmut into Sperny now let's go onto this map because we'll see it maybe a bit easier this is where we see one of the most major changes I think we've seen in a while that Russia seemed to gain a lot of territory here over the past 24 hours so this area was pretty much holding still for a long time but we see between the third sorry the fifth and then the sixth, we do see that Russia did make some significant gain in here, but also Ukraine did make some near Rozdolovka here as well. So let's go to there. We see that Ukraine made some significant gains there, and so did Russia out here. So let's see then what Suryak says about this. So, situation on the Eastern Front. As a result of the positional battles, Russian army recovered some of its lost positions east of Sperny. Now, interestingly... This is right here. See this road? This is this part here. So it does say that Russia gained just a little bit in here, but this map definitely shows different to that. Shows significantly more jumping up on the deep state, like Ukrainian Western sources map, than anywhere else. Now, this is actually also shown across, if we go daily Ukraine map update, of course, this is Bakhmut down here. Jump up. This is Sperny just here. And we see this over the past 24 hours. Of course, the dark red is Russia, that they had a significant jump up there as well. So I like when different maps from different sources confirm things because we know then something has moved. So we'll pick up from Sperny and then we'll move up into the northeast of Ukraine where Russia continue trying to advance around Vilshana Kupiansk district. It's really the Kupiansk front here. Now, we do see that Ukraine made some grains in here. So... Situation on the northeastern front. The recent Russian army bombardment are allowed to modify the front west of Luman, where Ukrainian army managed to recapture lost positions three weeks ago following positional battles in the area. So, of course, geolocated stuff shows that this has changed, but it hasn't updated yet on the deep state map. So, where we see is this, like, say, six ways bloody thing here comes through. See this clearing? So, we'll match up this clearing and this funny shaped bit here. Funny shape bit that Ukraine has cleared this territory in here. Hasn't yet updated on either of these maps. Surprisingly, because these are very pro-Ukrainian maps. Anyway, legends. I don't know how, but this video was so difficult to get through. I just couldn't speak. Maybe a day off killed me. Anyway, look after yourself. Have a great weekend. I'll speak to you very, very soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.